Peter Graves read the script and threw it across the room. Said, that's the biggest piece of garbage I've ever read. Uh-huh. And his daughters and his agent both said, dad, come on, you know, Peter, you've got to look at this. They're, they're talking about this being maybe kind of a funny film. So he looked at it and then he finally got it. He got into it. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of the Philosophers Movie Talk Show. I'm Chris Bush. And I'm Dean Slider. On the Philosophers, we talk about films and philosophy with the people who make and who love the movies. And it is our delight to have on our show today, actor Robert Hayes, who's star of television and film, credits such as um, Take This Job and Shove It, Homeward Bound, The Incredible Journey, superhero movie, um, uh, am, am I leaving anything out? Scandalous. <laughs> <laughs> that was in England. That was a fun one. That was England. Oh, Starman the series. Yeah. Oh, Starman the series and Angie, the voice of Tony Stark. Unabomber. Uh, the, 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 there you the, go. <laughs> Kaczynski was it his brother on, on yeah. the Unabomber? Yeah. On the, yeah. the Unabomber. So very, but I a little bit teasing. Most notably, this. Star, uh, starring as Ted Stryker in the movie Airplane, the classic cult comedy Airplane. I thought you were going to say, yeah, yeah, and that was pretty much all I can think of, and then yeah. leave it. I was actually thinking of saying to Dean before the show, well, maybe we should, we should mess with him and not even, what if we didn't mention Airplane the whole show? Would he think we were culturally ignorant? Would he, th- would he think we were snobs? Would he know we were pranking him? Would he be relieved not to have to talk about it? An experiment. Uh, what, just on it's that note. What I watch when I've seen some interviews with you on um, on the internet, you're always so gracious to take people's questions, and you seem so patient and so so agreeable. Was that something you had to really work on? Because I could imagine after so many years of hearing the same same stuff, it would be a little challenging. Well, there's a technique I have for it, um, and it's usually with a very kind of an imposing person that I have just off the camera and they're holding a knife and so if I start to get a little press it just threatens me and then I back off and I it's just it's a, it's simple but it works it really is great and did you learn that in acting class is that no, for David David Zucker oh actually it was... <laughs> as Jerry as... and Jim and David they would take turns they would just <laughs> whip me or they they got this thing with the broken glass that they developed that was really kind as, of, I mean, anyway anyway we're getting off that as 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 Lawrence Olivier is supposed to have said to I think it was Dustin Hoffman dear boy have you tried acting <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's where after he had slept in the gutter all night getting ready right. for the yeah for mm-hmm. the scene and he so comes in just all right. again, I think. And then telling him about how it was good, what he was doing. Yes, yes. dear boy, dear boy. Ralph, I did, uh, uh, not Ralph, I was going to say Ralph Richardson, but there was Sir John Gielgud. Sometimes they just seem like all two those, peas in a pod to me. All those Brits look alike. Yeah, but those two especially, they just, they've done so many things together, you know, it makes me just, but uh, uh, I did a film, I was fortunate to do a film, Scandalous, over in England with him. And, um, Everything that it, it seemed to always start with, ja boy, ja boy. Or if I'd say something, he'd say, oh, ja boy. I came on the set. Now, this, this film was, here we go again. Right. Uh, my friend Rob Cohen and I wanted to do a picture together. And he was a wonderful producer, but he was just getting his directing started. And, and uh, so he wrote the script. He and his partner wrote the script. And he knew me very well, so he incorporated all sorts of things about me. I, they were all, you know, it's like, how does he know that? How does he know that? Uh, he gets the money. He says, we've got the financing. I said, great. And he said, okay, where do you want to film this? In, in uh, Rome or in London? And I thought, holy moly, either place is great. I don't know. I'm kind of feeling like London. He says, me too. He gets over to London and he says, for one of your supporting actors, I have either uh, Alec Guinness or Sir John Gielgud. And I thought, oh my God, two of the greatest actors of the 20th century. And, and uh, it wound up being Sir John. And at the first day on the set, I come on the set 
and people are all, you know, kind of, you know, trying to get to know each other and they're a little uncomfortable at first. And the crew, I like to get to know the crew and get everybody. And, and so John comes in and, and I said, well, good morning, Sir John. And we'd had dinner, Rob and John and I. And so, uh, and the crew goes walking back and say, good morning, Johnny. And I thought, <laughs> what the heck did they just call him Johnny? And I turned to him and I said, well, Sir John, how are you doing? That's great. Yes. Well, okay. Well, and we would do things. And I, every morning I'd say, good morning, Sir John. Well, good morning, Sir John. <laughs> and they kept walking by saying Johnny. And I thought, I'm the star of this film. I ought to be able to call him Johnny. <laughs> the one morning I came on and said, morning, Johnny. <clears throat> Listen, so John, can I get you? Uh, <laughs> I couldn't do it. Uh -huh. I just couldn't do it. You, you, it's cute. You know, you just mentioning the two of them, Guinness and Gilgood. I, I was thinking that, um, you know, for Gilgood's amazing career and his legacy, he, he may be best known to popular audiences as the butler and Arthur. And, and right. Guinness for his amazing film legacy as Obi-Wan Kenobi, yeah. you know, for film goers. Are you right. happy, content for Ted Stryker to be your film well, legacy? Uh, I'm putting you in the same league as you those have guys, what, by the way. Yes, oh, yes, yes, of course. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Sir Robert. Uh, uh, people, people come up to me a lot and they say, uh, it was always like the opening thing they'd say, oh, I know, I'm so sorry. I'm sure you're so tired of hearing this, but oh, I loved you in the film. And, and uh, I would, I'd stop and I'd say, okay, stop right there. And I, and I or, or I know you hate to hear this. You probably hate to hear this, they would say, or tired or, or hate. And I'd say, okay, stop right there. I said, no, let's figure this out. You took a chance that I'm one of those jerks that you come up to and they're going to yell and say, get away from me. So right there, you're kind of a little on edge. You know you're taking a chance doing that. And then you want to tell me how much you love something that I did. Now, how can I hate that? And they'd think about it and say, yeah. <laughs> and then we'd laugh and then they'd take hands and take pictures, whatever. But that was my first feature film, Airplane was. And it was really, really like winning the lottery because I got to meet the boys and we're still friends 41 years later. And uh, they were brilliant and it was their first film to direct and they knew what they wanted so much, but they had a great crew and our fearless leader, Howard Koch, guiding them and all of us. So they were able to really make what their vision was and they were wonderful and every day you would wake up and you couldn't wait to get to work and there are shows that i've woke up and i thought oh god i gotta get to, okay just deal with that person let them do what they're gonna do it's just uh but this was every day i couldn't wait to see julie and leslie and bob stack and and peter and lloyd and i mean uh, and lorna patterson and i mean all the people and the boys and, and uh, Julie said something that was, she said something one time that was, uh, uh, in an, I saw it in an interview, or maybe we were doing it together, but she, she said, I would be in makeup and I would hear this laughter starting from the stage, the entrance, way over across the sound stage. And then I would hear it ripple and ripple as it got closer and closer to me. And I knew it was Bob coming in. <laughs> and so it was like, oh, what a great day we're going to have. Uh -huh. And I thought that's one of the nicest things people have said to me, oh, you know, anybody. Nice. And uh, so that's the kind of thing that it was. Now, the fact that it exploded and it's just broke the box office records. I think every theater had played that across the country and in theaters around the world. That that was a gift that we all as actors, for the most part, uh, uh, people dream of because I mean the very next go around for films all of a sudden you have a stack of scripts that come in you're not out pounding the pavements and going up and say hi can I read for your movie hi here's my picture can I read and you have to go in and be rejected and go in and be rejected all of a sudden they're giving you a stack of scripts and you go through and you're reading them and you're trying to find something that's fun oh where's this one being shot oh this is fun oh this and I, I didn't have, um, I've got a wonderful manager, uh, Fran, but 
Uh, I didn't have a manager. I had a, a, an agent who was terrific, but he was mainly used to television and he was really a great negotiator, but he didn't have the, that vision on the film side of things as much. And so it was up to just me to, well, what do you want to do? And I didn't have a thought about uh, what builds your career. I was just looking at just what would be fun? What would the audience get a kick out of seeing? And what would I enjoy doing? And so it kind of went from that standpoint. So there were films that I could have made better choices, but I've had a lot of fun with them. And so I had a solid 20 or 30 years of uh, uh, really, really a fun career. And not a lot of people in the business can say that. There's just a small group that can, in, in the scope of how many people are members of SAG, right? Mm -hmm. How many actually can say that they've had that situation. So I'm blessed and absolutely blessed. It's a beautiful attitude, and um, I'm, I'm sure for some, having that kind of quick success can be a curse as well as a blessing. And, you know, um, I guess it's just how, how the individual handles a quick success is it's, it must be very individual. Well, they, they uh, I had great parents who are, you know, God bless them, are gone, but I was blessed to have a great family. And they'd kind of <laughs> keep you in line too. And brought up set, right. Yeah, well, at least they gave me the chance to be. It was up to me to screw it up later on, but you know, at least they they tried to get me on the right course. But but uh, when I when I uh, when I'd be on a set, and this started happening, I didn't realize it at first, but it took like a, you know a few films, but. I, I never, and still, I, I didn't realize the power that I had in that position until, you know, later when things were starting to kind of go on the wane a bit. One example was um, we had we were filming over in the valley in LA, over in the valley in the in a uh, you know Leave It to Beaver kind of a street with all the trees and and our our AD who's a terrific guy, but. He would yell, he'd scream like they normally do, you know, quiet on the set, quiet on the set. And, and I thought, God, I see neighbors come out and you'd see them be annoyed. And I, I've been around that and I see people being really annoyed. That's not necessary. You don't have to do that. And so I kind of went up to him once and I said, you know, I said, you got to do me a favor. When you yell out like that, it's just so jarring. And I'm really working to get into my character which I wasn't, but I just used it anyway. I was trying to soften the blow for him. And I said, I said, but it's really messing me up. So um, I was wondering if, if you could just say, uh, if you just say quiet on the set, if you're standing next to me, I'll pass it on. And then we'll pass it on. Say, hey, pass it on, quiet on the set. And he said, what? And I said, you know, it's just, because somebody else, actually somebody on the set had, it was really bugging him. And so I took it and, you know, went to him with that. And I said, yeah, if you could just do that. And so later we're getting ready to film and he went, quiet on the set. And I said, perfect. <laughs> hey guys, let's have quiet on the set. We're going to film now, okay? And they all went, oh, okay. And everyone just got quiet and then we filmed. So it got the tone down and it was, uh, at the end of the day, I, I usually wind up working with the crew and wrapping cables because I want them to get out of it real quick so we can all go and I can buy the first round of beer for them, whatever. We have a really good time. It, everyone gets to where they're working better and more smoothly, you get things done quicker. It, it, there's so much angst and there's so much stuff inside when you're working on a character, you, you can't fix something. There's so much junk inside that can bubble up and you need it to come out it can't come out or you're having trouble you can't figure it out whatever that you don't need to have a lot of extra attitude and you know jerk off personalities and you don't need that stuff so i tried to say set a good uh, tone when i was there you know being able to at the top and just let that go down and i've had people years and years later come up to me even nowadays people come up and they tell me that was their first job was working on the thing that I did. And I got to tell you, you were so great. 
And it just kind of gave me an idea of how you act on the set. And it was really great. I, it was, how, how great does that make you feel? You know? So, so. Uh, Watching Airplane, one does get the feeling that that film could only be made by people who were enjoying working together. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was, it, it was, ah. and <laughs> Leslie. Now, I don't know if you know about Leslie, but he was known and not not an airplane because that was kind of at the beginning of it all. Mm -hmm. But uh, later on, he became known for his his flatulence. Uh huh. Uh, but it was uh, actually uh, a little uh, machine. Uh, oh, uh huh. So it was like a whoopee cushion in his hand. And so in my scenes, I mean, this was all on this. Oh my god! But in the scene, like for instance, the cockpit when. Uh, Lorna Patterson, Randy, the mm -hmm. stewardess, gets me, brings me up front. When when uh, uh, Jesse is about to immolate himself, you know, with the the turban and he's gouges himself with gasoline, mm -hmm. and and uh, he's saying, you know, they need me up front. Well, yeah, but I want to. I'm sure he wants to hear the rest of my story, and he's just looking at me like. <laughs> so I go up there, and Leslie, uh, I see it's both pilots. Can you fly on this fly this plane? And that was the first time I say, surely you can't be serious. And then he, had, you know, mm -hmm. and then I have this whole speech about having flown single engine fighters in the war. This is four engines. That's an entirely different kind of flying altogether. And they say altogether. Right. It's that whole, it was a, a three shot of us and then a two shot of them. But then on my single, the whole time, if you were to hear the soundtrack without, you know, like what they cut, what they recorded originally, it was Mr. Striker. Can can you land this plane? <laughs> Always, and I had to keep a straight face in that, and that was the hardest thing in the whole show for me. <laughs> That's fun. Um, Julie Haggerty, I get the impression, you know, either she's just superb at acting a lovely sweet person, or she has to be a lovely sweet person. She's actually both. Uh, it's both. Uh, she is one of the sweetest people, maybe the sweetest person I've ever met in my life. Wow. Uh, just a, an example of, of how sweet she is. And that's her voice, that little voice of hers. Mm -hmm. That's her voice. It's just darling. But we were right behind the cockpit and we have a scene. And I was doing a series called Angie at the time. And it overlapped when we were shooting an airplane by a couple of weeks. And in Angie, if we'd have a guest star come on, and a lot of times they feel like an outsider with the regular cast. And I've been in that position and you just feel like you're an outsider and people don't normally bring you into it. But I used to try to bring them in. And then if they would, if they would be so nervous and they'd muff a line, I, you know, berate them like, what do you got? Oh my God, look at now, ruin the whole thing is ruined. You screwed the lineup. And then we'd start the next thing and I'd blow a line. <laughs> ah, you know and they'd laugh and so it made everything more comfortable well we started the line said action and she blew the line and they said cut and that little voice of her said i'm sorry he said no no, no it's okay julia it's all right the script supervisor have you got the line could you give her the line and she says i'm sorry he said no 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 it's okay it's okay and so we got the line and then we're ready to shoot and i'm thinking about that and she just seemed so you know a little nervous and, and you just want to hold her. She's that kind of a person. So we started the, the scene and I was so distracted thinking about, should I blow a line on purpose or not? That I blew the line and they cut. And she said, I'm sorry. I said, no, Julie, it wasn't you. It was Bob. And she said, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> but she's, she's got, she's a little pistol. She can stand up for herself. Mm -hmm. But she's um, and she's learned that now through because because she was taken advantage of earlier by, you know, mean people on the sets and the producers. And uh, mm -hmm. so she, she but she's gotten a lot tougher, but uh, she's just wonderful. And that character that she plays is wonderful. I don't think anybody else could have done that like her as well. Yeah. yeah. And then you've got, of course, all the guys who were from you know about a generation or half generation earlier playing right. these these kind of ac action roles straight and now they yeah. are playing them as as parody but you know I, I, I mean what a lineup robert stack 
uh, their first church, Robert Stack, Bob Stack was the very first person that came to mind to them when yeah. they started writing the script. It was Bob Stack for Kramer. And is it wanted true, Elliot Ness? Right. And is it true that when he wades through the airport and he's being accosted by the Hare Krishnas and everyone else trying to sell him flowers, and he's like fighting his way through, that he did all that? He did all those stunts? Yeah. 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 That's yeah. amazing. He was in, in great shape. Yeah. He was in great shape. He was an amazing guy. I love that guy. He was yeah. That was really one of the more brilliant innovations mm -hmm. of that film was casting these classic, you know, 50s. Yeah film actors peter graves lloyd bridges leslie nielsen robert yeah. in these roles having him play it you know not playing it for laughs and i mean look what it did for leslie nielsen it created you know he had a he had a you know a pretty lucrative third act with the, the uh, <laughs> yeah naked naked gun and dracula dead and loving it and all oh things. he was always that that strong kind of i remember when i was little and I'm older than you guys, I'm sure. So when I was little, there was Forbidden uh, Planet. Forbidden Planet. There, no, before that, it was Disney on the Disney Channel. He was oh, uh, the Fox. Captain Marion, the Swamp Fox. The Swamp Fox. And it was the Revolutionary War. It was kind of like a, a bunch of Green Berets in, in, yeah. the, in the American Army in the Revolutionary War. And I always thought, God, he's the coolest because I was a little, little guy. So then you know, all the other things he did, he played, you know, in Bonanza, he played a big, rich, rival ranch owner that was really a bad guy so he played a lot of bad guys but he also did some light comedy some you know films that that he did light comedy romantic comedies and things like that but never anything this wacko mm -hmm. and his line was he said i i've always wanted to go over into that area of lunacy but he says that uh the boys offered that opportunity. I went up and I opened the door, but it was the boys that pushed me through. Mm -hmm. And that was his line about that. You know, all those guys were great, but I, I have to say the one that really just knocks me out every time um, is Lloyd Bridges. <laughs> his, his stuff is just so, somehow it's so tight. It's so yeah. on it. You know what He's I mean? He's great. Yeah. He's great. The funny thing about that is I think that, Bob Stack, I think, got it right away. And I think he, I mean, there was a little adjustment with the boys say getting him, you know, really on to what it was, but he got it. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter Graves read the script and threw it across the room. So that's the biggest piece of garbage I've ever read. Uh -huh. And his daughters and his agent both said, Dad, come on, you know, Peter, you've got to look at this. They're talking about this being maybe kind of a funny film. So he looked at it and then he finally got it. He got into it. We were, we were rehearsing in one of those dance rehearsal areas with the mirror and the bar on the side and the hardwood floor. They taped out the cockpit. They taped out about where the uh, 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 tower was going to be. So it was Bob Stack, Bob and Lloyd and Julie and I, and we had a little rehearsal period there. And I remember Lloyd just kind of... <sighs> He just had that something aggravated him, just something bugging him. And we were, you know, everyone was trying to kind of say lines and go through this stuff. And then finally he said, well, well what, what are we doing? I mean, what are we doing? It was just really uh, it was so frustrating. <laughs> something. And Bob Stack said with that Elliot Ness voice, as he said, oh, come on, Lloyd. They just want us to be us. <laughs> and, and Lloyd and Lloyd just kind of scowled and went, uh, uh. and then he just started thinking about it, and then he really got it, mm -hmm. and that's the stuff that you saw. And he, yeah. he's he's a wonderful. I mean, they all are such wonderful actors, but I've always thought Lloyd was really had a real kind of special thing in him, and it shows yeah. in all that stuff that he yeah. did. When 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 he settles into he he's always got the cigarette, and it's always two thirds gone. Yes. And like every shot, <laughs> they must have had a yeah. prop girl cutting like a hundred yeah. cigarettes with scissors. And, yeah, when, and sometimes you'd stick a wire or something to hold that ash on there. You know? Ah, I mean, that's one trick. I don't know if they use that, but that's one trick. Yeah. And the, and the one shot where he like settles into this stern pose with, I think his hands on the desk and he's right, right. under the portrait of himself and exactly Doing the, the same, same pose. And like, that's how, <laughs> <laughs> how crisp he is, though, in, in each move, in each beat. Yeah, yeah. But that's 
that's the guys. They are so, people say that must have been a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, ad libbing. I said, no, no, no. no, no. Those mm-hmm. guys got rejected. They send it to a studio, get rejected, go back and rewrite, rejected and rewrite. And, and they kept doing it to where it was such a tight script. The only re- the only ad living was um, they would call up a member of their Kentucky Fried Theater group, mm-hmm. uh, Steve Stucker, who played Johnny. Mm-hmm. And they said, so what, I mean, how can you write for Johnny? They, mm-hmm. Because that's what they wanted was him. Mm-hmm. And they said, okay, Steve, what would Johnny say here? Oh, I could make a brooch. I could make a hat. I could make a, you know, or it's like a big Tylenol or, you know, all those things. Yep. Heath, Kurt, uh, Barkley, there's a fire in the barn. You know, it just, it was just him being nuts. You know, and, in the, in, in, in the Marx Brothers films, there were, there mm-hmm. were places where in the script, it, all it says is Harpo does something funny. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that was, yeah. he was Harpo. Yeah. The yeah. other thing was was uh, um, uh, Al uh, White, Al and Norm. Uh, they played the the uh, black dudes. Oh yeah, and they went up to the boys and asked them. Uh, they said, "Do you mind if we change this dialogue? A, 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 we kind of have an idea." And they said, "Oh please, we're mm-hmm. three white Jewish guys from Milwaukee. We don't know because <laughs> all they wrote was she mofo, she mofo, she mofo. Right. That's all they wrote, mm-hmm. and and." Uh, Al and Norm had worked up these routines. Al told me that he got a dictionary of black, uh, black jive, uh-huh. that there actually were books about that. And he and Norm had come up with their own stuff too. So they created this whole deal and that was them. They wrote that and then they helped Barbara Billingsley, yeah. uh, you know, get her stuff down. I mean, to bring in Mrs. Leave it to Beaver, <laughs> June Cleaver, to, 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 to play off of those guys. That's brilliant. Now, let me ask you, could you see Harriet Nelson playing that because we that was their they, first, that she was offered, first choice. We heard they were, she was the first choice and actually right. said to the boys at some point later, or to you later on, so you ran into her, somebody yeah, ran into yeah. her and she, she expressed regret she, at not having. She was worried about the language. Right. And then she was, she was sorry. She said, I'm so sorry. I didn't do it. Yeah. But, but, but you can't really think of anybody but Barbara, even though oh no, she's Harriet would have been wonderful. Yeah. But, she, but Barbara, you, you know, and the same with Kareem. You think of Kareem being, how can it be somebody else? But they originally wanted to be Rose. Well, I, Bob, you, you mentioned rehearsing in the dance space. And I have mm-hmm. to ask you about the fact that you had to dance the Travolta routine while juggling. Yeah. Now, are, are we yeah. actually seeing what where are you actually doing yeah. what we're seeing there yeah well we had julie and i had uh two guys jim um oh what the other name? he was like a, a staff choreographer at disney mm-hmm. so he worked on a lot of the disney stuff and a wonderful guy and um uh lester um lester this wilson. is when you get all the, everybody starts name? going yes lester wilson and he's the guy that that uh, was one of the main choreographers on uh, uh, Saturday Night Live, Saturday Night Fever, mm-hmm. and they always say Denny Terrio was the guy that did all that, and I'm sure that that's what you know he did a lot of that. But the the kind of the the flavors of it and moves and stuff that he gave John that was Lester that mm-hmm. did that. So we had both of those guys that mm-hmm. were our choreographers and and. Um, and when we got to the set to film it, like if you're the camera mm-hmm. and I walk out, I throw my hat away, leave, it comes back and hits the bartender and I walk up to Julie and we're standing there and we're gonna start the dance, but the camera's over here. And they said, we have to have you around this way. Can't you do, and they're all like, Dee, what do we do? Cause we were under pressure to get this done. And I said, I got an idea, one of my few ideas, I said, what if I come up to her and we stalk each other like animals in the jungle and I get around to that side, then I take off the coat, throw it away, strike the pose, the coat hits me, and then we start dancing. He said, well, let's try it. So we did it and said, perfect, it works. And as we're doing all of that, one of the things that Johnny did in Saturday Night Fever that made me laugh was this move. Mm -hmm. I just thought that was one of the funniest things. So I wanted to do that, but I wanted the hands to suddenly start having a life of their own, jerking me <laughs> off the camera. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, and then Jim, 
said, uh, Abram said, can you juggle? And I said, yeah. And they threw in some balls or oranges or whatever that I, and so that was on the spot. That was mm. just right on the spot. Well, you executed the scene commendably, I must say. <laughs> I want to Thank say, you know, and really when you mentioned Marx Brothers earlier, Dean, it really, to me, it is kind of the Marx Brothers school of kitchen sink humor where it's just like, and it's nonstop. Did you, yeah. did you have a sense when you were cast and you were making the film that it would be, you know, such a classic, or did you think this no. could be the end of a brand new, you know, career? <laughs> no, I never thought that, but what I did think was, as we're doing it, I thought, wow, you know, this could be like, maybe really good. Like it could get a cult following on college campus, you know, which is always sort of a neat thing, I guess. And then when they graduate college and live through life, they that carry that film with them. So it's always sort of a popular film in a small way, but you know, but having a cult classic would be really fun. And then as it went along, uh, I was hearing that uh, like John Davison, the, the line producer, our producer on it, um, he would come back and he said, oh, this is bad, this is bad. I said, what do you mean it's bad? And he was a worry word, wonderful, wonderful guy, but he was a worry word. I said, what do you mean it's bad? He said, the dailies, they look too good. People are laughing too hard, it's, that's a bad sign. <laughs> I said, what? The, what? The, the, isn't that what you want? Apparently they were having to screen the dailies and then run them again and run them and keep filling the room up with new people. All the people wanted to get in to see them. And uh, so I, then we started feeling, all of us kind of started feeling that maybe it's gonna be something a little more. You don't wanna really go there. You wanna leave it just very ethereally out there, a very, you know, nebulous kind of don't don't even try to you don't want forget to about it. it right and one young kid there were about five of us standing around and a, a young uh i think it was extra or a day player came up and he walked up into the group with hey guys wow i hear this thing's really gonna be a huge hit and we all turned and just walked away <laughs> 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 don't jinx it and he was standing there like what what did they say what did they say mm -hmm. but uh yeah and then uh, and then when it came out uh Friends called me and said, I saw the trailer. I was over at the films and I saw a trailer for your movie. Those are all the jokes, right? Mm -hmm. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no. Right. No, it was so much fun. Yeah. Um, let's talk about some of your favorite films. Uh, we got a, a lovely list from you um uh, this was kind of like ted striker wrote it right this kept going yeah, on right and on, on and on and on and on and on but but i i i i have to say your 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 taste is impeccable uh i mean you know william powell jimmy stewart oh. right yeah. those those guys yeah. those yeah. guys all Henry those Fonda. Yeah. yeah all those thin man films and mm. it's interesting to watch them now because uh, I mean, you have a problem making a whole series of films now where alcoholism is presented yeah, that's right. yeah. as, yeah. as so elegant and hilarious. Yes. It's, a, it's an elegant character on its own. Yeah. yeah. I think Nick and Nora have drinks in their hands the whole movie. All the time, at night All when the they time. go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> Wake <laughs> up in the morning and have a drink. This is a great, great exchange in one of the Thin Man films where she says, Would you like a drink? He says, what do you think? Yes, yes, of course. And then when they go to, they're, they're questioning uh, the guy that's over with his, you know, sleazy girlfriend in their rundown, beat up apartment. And the, Nat Pendleton, the, the cop, is a sergeant or whatever, is, is questioning the guy. And Powell's sitting there and he's at the table and he looks and there's this just cheap crap rot gut whiskey. And he, uh, and it's and it's poured. It's in a glass. So they've been drinking it. And he looks at it and he just picks it up and takes a sense. It's like, oh, that's awful. And he drinks more of it. <laughs> it's like relentless, just relentless. I, I I have to tell you that when I was in my early twenties, before I was married, and I was the whole idea of marriage just struck me full of abject terror, it was, and watching one of the thin man films was the made me think it was the first time i ever had the thought oh 
marriage could be really fun. You know, <laughs> yes. the way they did it. Oh, it's sexy. And it's you tease each other. And it's I go, okay, yeah. I could do that. And you drink a lot. Yeah, and you drink a lot. And <laughs> of course, so you, you need a lot of good champagne and you need Myrna Loy. <laughs> you know, Jimmy Stewart one time said that it should be against the law uh, for someone not to fall in love with Myrna Loy. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, she was, oh, man, she was something. Yeah. And, and William Powell just, he just gets me. I mean, my when I was, when I started out, I had four guys that were kind of the guys that I always thought of when I thought of roles that I could do. And, and it was, it was Jimmy Stewart and Henry Fonda and Gary Cooper and, and uh, Cary Grant. And I thought, well, I'm kind of a tall, lanky guy and, and I like comedy and it would be that kind of, you know, these things that they do and, you know, roles of it, but it was also Spencer Tracy and William Powell and Cagney and, I mean, it was just on and on. And of course, you know, Brando, I'm not a, that type, but um, I, there are actors, I've heard other actors say it, but to me, it's, I agree with them that I think maybe on the waterfront, maybe the greatest performance ever captured on film. It just yes. astounds me. Yes. It just astounds me. And I watch it and I've seen it a million times and I'll, and I'll be flipping through the channel and it's on the waterfront and I just stop for a second. And I just say, yeah, no, I'm not going to watch it, but yeah, but look at that. Yeah. Look at that. Next thing you know, you've seen the whole film again. Yeah. If this any, is any, anyone that's watching this that has never seen on the waterfront, please make that the very next thing you do. Do not eat until you've seen on the waterfront because and everybody that, is great in it. Oh my God. Everyone's Carl, great. But Brando Carl, is just, yeah. No. Lee J. But Carl, Rod, Carl Malden, uh, oh, Rod Snyder, first oh, film, yeah. all of them. Yeah. Huh. There was a famous uh, a story about Steiger and Brando. You know, I don't know if you know the, uh, oh, in the, the scene in, in the, the back. back of the cab. Yeah. Yeah. I could have been a contender. It could have been, you know, a contender instead of a bum, which is what I am. And every time I think it was when he said, no, no, it was you, Paul, it was you. Every time he did that, Steiger would start crying because he was known as a real emotional type actor and he was crying, right. but he would go into it crying and they'd shoot the scene again. And, and every time, like he'd reach over to, think, and as he began, he would start crying. And he went to the director, Brando did, and he said, he said, every time I reach over, he starts crying. He said, I can't, what, what? And he says, let's just, uh, let's shoot your scene. And once we got your scene, um, go ahead and go to the bathroom or go do something. And then they shot Steiger's close up. And Steiger said, well, where's Brando? Huh? Oh, he, I think he had to go over, he's in the bathroom. So, but let's just shoot the scene. So they shot the close up without Brando there. And he just seemed a little, where am I going to cry here? What do I? And so it made it even more real because he was dealing with what he was trying, trying to figure mm -hmm. out. And mm -hmm. you can use that as in the scene. Mm -hmm. But I always thought that was just, a, I, I finally wound up thinking of things like that and things that my acting coach, uh, Sal Dano, uh, told me as an actor. I used those when I directed and it was to trick people into things. You tell them something and they're not getting it. It doesn't resonate with them the same way. You keep going at them. You go a little bit this way and a little bit this way and you, you're working and it's not working. And finally, uh, I, in one scene, I went up to one of the actors and I said, okay, never mind about that because I don't think that's really right. Instead, I want you to just be so, because they're supposed to show a real love or a real something. And it was not coming off at all. I said, I think you just really are annoyed by these people. You just hate them. So let's just do that. We'll get it done. We'll get that out of the way. Well, they changed their whole attitude and it had an energy that was so much more interesting. And it's what I wanted because love and hate, there's such a similarity of the energy inside mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. and, and it can be expressed uh, uh, in such a way that you'll, you, you can see someone doing something in a silent, without any sound, without anything to tell you what's going on. And you can think, oh my God, they are aching. They're so in love with that. 
Yeah. And what it really is, is they just say how much they hate the damn thing, but you don't know that. They're just, and they're showing that intensity. Whereas if you're saying, oh, you really love it. And they're saying, oh, that nice. And it's just one little plain dull note. That, Isn't that nice? Okay, great. It's not interesting. Mm -hmm. Let's do it some other way. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, that was interesting to, to, uh, you pick up stuff like that from other actors. That's what we do. We're sponges in this business. And you use it for acting. You also use it for directing. You use it for however to get the thing done, get what you want, and then have that to go into edit, mold, and shape, and sculpt. But, you know, taking, kind of taking on your, on your comment just there and reflecting on, reflecting on Brando's performance in On the Waterfront, it just, and I watched it again, actually, just a couple of weeks ago, it just seemed like his internal life as the character, as the character Terry, it was so rich and fully realized, it, oh. you know, you didn't have to express a lot on the outside for you to really feel, you know. My, my coach like told me, he told me a story about Brando, which was his favorite actor. And, and it was, I think it was a play called A Diner, I think. And it was one of his first things, one of his early things on Broadway or on or off Broadway. And he used to go outside in the alley right behind the theater. And he would, he would find out, you know, okay, how much time we got before curtain. And he would take the, the uh, fire escape ladder down and run up and down the fire escape and just get absolutely winded. And then they'd say places and he'd go in and he'd just sit at the counter. And the, he wasn't one of the main characters, but the, one of the reviews was that uh, the show was interesting and this was going on, but I couldn't take my eyes off this young actor, one of the smaller roles, Marlon Brando. And the whole audience, and he, was doing, he wasn't doing anything but sitting there. But he was sitting there with such a binge and a furnace of stuff going on. And all of he's doing, he wasn't trying to do it. He was just trying to breathe. He was just trying to breathe and just trying to sit and just relax. And it exploded. The guy you know, was just amazing. I, I don't know when this will show, but we're, we're taping this in August of 2021. And a few days ago, Charlie Watts, the great, Rolling Stones drummer just died. And I didn't know that. Oh, uh, oh, I'm sorry to break it. Oh, wow. but but read yeah. the New York Times piece on him from about two days ago, I think it was that he died. Beautiful, beautiful piece and wonderful tributes from different musicians. And my favorite thing that someone said about Charlie Watts was he never took a solo because he didn't have to. <laughs> that's great yeah that yeah. is great yeah oh man yeah mm. wow charlie watts yeah great great yeah yep. but you know it's uh, uh, uh russ kunkel a uh, uh, friend is is one of the all-time great drummers with with james taylor and you know lyle and uh, all these people and he told me that he, there's a difference. There are drummers that want to just get out there and really shine. It's like everyone's fighting for their moment on stage. And he loved what his whole, his whole objective on stage was, was to get right behind those people, the lead singer, all the people playing and adjust. It it's like lifting them up and holding them. Yep. And so you're not the focus, but that's why they all love playing with him because he makes everyone look better. Yep. And that makes him look better, you know, yep. just because you're a part of that whole group. And that's a real giving uh, musician. That's a really amazing musician. That's why he's one of the greats. But that's Charlie. I got, always got that feeling about him. Yeah. That he wasn't like, hey, look at me. It was like, yeah, I'm just- They, they, they mentioned you know. in the Times story when the, when the Stones were first starting, they were this scrappy young, you know, group doing, covers of American R&B and they had no money yeah. and they knew what they needed was a great drummer and Charlie Watts was already doing paying gigs as a jazz drummer and jazz was always his real passion and that's really oh. basically what he brought was that jazz swing that he put uh -huh. behind their 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 rock and roll so in order to hire him and this is about to me this is in acting movies all the arts 
doing what you mm -hmm. have to do, right? Seeing right, what right. you need, seeing what you need, and then doing what you have to do to get it. They knew they needed Charlie Watts. They couldn't afford him. They couldn't afford to pay him. And so they, they starved themselves and they shoplifted to afford <laughs> Charlie Watts. <laughs> So he was illegally obtained. So he was he was he was <laughs> obtained by nefarious means. They worked out. Wow. Well, they were yes, it did. Yeah. Thank God. Yeah. Yeah. Thank wow. God. Right. You mentioned wow. Robert. You you also mentioned um, George Stevens' 1953 Shane as one of your oh. fav favorite films. I mean, you listed a lot of them. We can't talk about them all, but I I wonder if you could just talk a little bit of, uh, with us about what it is about that movie that you love so much if their favorite scenes any you know what 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 stands out for you oh god so much i mean alan ladd and, and alan ladd with what he dealt with with the height and having to film him on boxes or digging trenches for the leading lady to walk in you know these things what must that have done to him and yet to be able to i mean that voice of his that's, I think he started out on radio and th that voice was just this incredible gift that he had. But uh, they were all, they were all so great. Oh, um, oh shoot. Gene Arthur, Van Gene Huffman. Arthur, Gene Arthur. I don't know why I go blank on these. Gene Arthur is one of my favorite actresses, all time favorites. I mean, Catherine Hepburn, I mean, mm -hmm. but Gene Arthur is just, She's so great. And the one thing I loved about this was, uh, what year was this, 55-ish? 53, I think. 53, yeah. Uh, that's when they had the little cowboy hats that you used to get when you went to Disneyland, you know, that 50s style mm -hmm. cowboy hats. And everyone was clean and the women had such great makeup and their hair has been styled. Maybe they'll pull a little piece out, let the wind blow it a little so it looks like they've been rustled up a bit so they can be a frontier woman. But the makeup is pretty good, you know. It's all... She was as plain as a fresh dug out potato, you know. She was, <laughs> and, and it was brilliant. And, 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 uh, uh, and, and also um, um, Jack Palance. Jack Palance to me was, maybe the greatest Western villain that you can imagine. And the look when he walks out and you're seen on the, when he walks out on that uh, boardwalk, you know, right in front yeah. of the, the saloon. And then he stepped down and you got the dirt right there and he's standing there and they're having a little confrontation. And this, the profile of him, now he was a heavyweight fighter and and he was uh, very he was very good everybody i did a film with him and he told me the story he said world war ii saved his life actually mm. because he was a heavyweight fighter and he was very very good he was up in contention and and uh he was drafted and then he wound up being in the war and he saw a guy that that had been one of his you know sort of equals uh years later and uh in new york when he was working at radio cbs or something was a writer and he walked past and here's this guy he said go hey hey how you doing jack and he looked and he realized it was this guy and he said my god that could be me just all mushed up and you get hit right here and that's the speech center right up here mm -hmm. and he, his voice was kind of that hoarse voice and uh but so here he's this boxer this big chest strong guy tiny little you know almost flat butts skinny legs but he had that kind of shape to him with the boots out, that hat sitting back like that. And he just looked so scary. But Polans had that ability to do that. And the, the photography in that was incredible. The, I mean, everything about that film, it just is beyond Western. It becomes a, a great film, not just a great Western, but a great film. Uh, and, and it just, I don't know, it just knocks me out, that whole thing. Since, Brandon to will to everything. Since, since you mentioned Gene Arthur, uh, I, I want to <laughs> bring up another of, of your favorites. Um, Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Yeah, maybe my all time favorite. It might oh, be. my God. Yeah. I, I just rewatched yeah. that last night. And yeah, oh my God, it's 
it, it's just so fantastic. She yeah. is, she's just great. And, <laughs> you know, it's funny that you say that about her and Shane, you know, not, not, try working hard at being pretty because she was yeah. famous at least in the earlier films and you see it in mr smith goes to washington you only well you see her right profile once she always had to be photographed from the left because that was her good mm -hmm. side so mm -hmm. that so that's fun but all the stuff between her and jimmy stewart it's yeah. just you, you, they don't make yeah. them like that anymore <laughs> yeah and with her and thomas mitchell and yeah. the, I mean, oh God! And Edward Arnold. Edward Arnold. Oh, mm -hmm. who plays maybe my favorite all-time favorite singer is James Taylor. And I realized one day as I'm watching, and wait a minute, he plays Jim Taylor, Jim Taylor. but he's the bad guy. What? What? Right. What? What are right. you doing to me? <laughs> right. Right. But oh my God, did I just I loved all of those people. Just loved them. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like it's Eugene like Paulette, every, everybody. Every, right. Every wait, what's that one? What's his name again? Oh, Eugene, Eugene Paulette. Eugene yes. Paulette. Is that who you're yeah. talking about? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, <laughs> hey, where would he go? Yeah, hey. Right, he was uh, brown and prior talk in uh, struggle, yes. Robin Hood, right? yes. yeah. struggling to get out of the phone booth. <laughs> or his chair or anything he's yeah. in. Yeah, but it's like yeah. every character actor from yeah. circa 1940 is in that film. Well, you know, that's the thing that, that Capra was, to me, absolutely just brilliant. He, he had the ingredients that you put in and he knew how to mix them. And he just knew how to stir that casserole. And so when you take a taste, you're not just eating that chunk of meat. You get all the juices and all the potatoes and the vegetables and everything, and they all taste so amazing. He has shots in all of his films. He has these shots where someone's talking and you just cut and you see a guy, an old, ancient old guy, scruffy, unshaven, looking up with finally with hope in their face because they're hearing something they needed to hear. For. But it's just like two seconds or three seconds long and it makes you feel like, wow. And so many directors wouldn't take time to put that in. They yeah. would just leave it on the actor, leave it on the, the whole audience and go back to the actor and go back to the audience, maybe shoot the audience. This, that. But he goes in and he just sees these great old wrinkled faces that are just wonderful. John Ford did that. Um, 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 Preston Sturgis did that. Mm -hmm. You know, those great guys, they did it better I think that period of time, of course, you know, 39 was the year in Hollywood, uh, in the history of Hollywood. It's astounding to think of how many unbelievable films came out in one year right. like that. And yeah. that's when all those directors were, you know, uh, it's just great. The, the, just the, great. the set in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington for the, the interior of the Senate. Mm -hmm. huge huge set i'm watching i'm going god did they really get permission yeah. to film in the senate because and but there's so much going on in those in those shots yeah you know it's so complex and the guy that the actor that holds it together is uh harry carey as who presiding oh over yes who has that, the least amount of lines but he is the anchor yeah of that he's the anchor yeah. And he got yeah, nominated. Yeah. He got nominated for supporting actor for that. And just like, like, yes. and, and half of what he's doing is just trying to suppress a smile, not show yeah. how much he's enjoying all the hijinks. Yeah. Leaning back, I'm doing the, the wrapper of gum, but yeah. up and then leaning back and just watching the circus go on and yeah. enjoying it. Yeah. Yeah. And the, and the, uh, the white knight. Oh, Claude Rains. Yeah. 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 He's, he, he's, He's wonderful, even though when you watch them, uh, British actors from that period, and you really do hear a lot of British coming through, or you hear a British actor trying to do an American accent, so they overdo certain words. But it all works for me. It all works just fine for me. Uh, they had what we were always used to use as a mid-Atlantic accent. You right. know, if you're, if you're having trouble with a British accent, you just do the mid-Atlantic which is just as proper as you can get enunciating properly and 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 uh uh it, it it it's funny i've got i have british friends that um i used to i used to do british i love british accents i used to do them and i in college i wound up being a british guy for a 
a couple of semesters uh, with these <laughs> girls. Uh -huh. A lot of it was British. And every time I'd sit down, they're talking with the other guys and I'd come and I'd just sit down because I was late and they'd shit at each other and say, oh, he even sits like he's British. They were so enamored of this British guy. Uh -huh. Until uh -huh. they finally found out, one of them told one of my friends told them I wasn't British, and they were all pissed off. But up until then, they couldn't tell; they didn't know. And I've actually I've done that with some British people that actually fell for it, that didn't know me. We didn't know each other, mm. and but British people, almost all British people, uh, and very very good friends of mine. If you do something and you do it with a British accent, they'll say, well, of course, you know, Americans can't do British accents. They're very arrogant about it. They're very snooty about it, which I've, I've told them to laugh about that. Uh, and that, that they turn around and they do an American accent and <laughs> like a New York, a New York Cockney, uh, the, uh, New York, you know, like, yo, hey, what are you doing? You know, hey, listen, I'm telling you, this is what, you know, that accent to them when they do it. And this was at the National Theater when they did Guys and Dolls. And Sir John told me, he says, oh, you must, oh, death boy, you must go see guys and dolls. They do the most amazing American accent. <laughs> well, the lead guy, Sky Masterson, actually did a good American accent. And the girl, uh, you know, it was okay. But when they got to the Stubby K role, right. I don't know who that was playing it, but that role with all those guys, and they start singing, you know, sit down, you're rocking the boat. Nicely, and, nicely. And, yes, right, right. And... So, you know, instead of, uh, you know, when they're talking to each other, they're like, yeah, well, let's go down over here. I says, Joey, what he's going to do? And theirs came out, right, well, let's go over here and ask Joey what he's going to do. <laughs> and that, to them, that's what their New York accent was. It was a Cockney. They said, oh, we'll just do a Cockney. That's what New York is. So You know, tons of British and Australian actors are in American films playing American. Oh, massive amounts. And I remember Renee Zellweger took so much heat for for playing bridget jones yeah they, they, you know it was like well i was on the sag board for for seven years and we had people that were really abused um by going over to england or australia new zealand and canada i did probably eight films seven or eight films in canada and the the uh there was such an attitude of uh, the super supervisor. I remember she was somebody that had some problems, emotional problems, but she was just so just negative all the time. And I said, well, I said, well, what's the matter? One day I finally just said, well, geez, what's the matter? And she just turned and snapped at me. I mean, she's very large, very overweight, very problems, just everything. And she just turned and snapped and said, how would you like to be the mouse? And when, every time the elephant rolls over, you have to get out of the way. And I thought, oh, and obviously it was, you know, Canada and the U.S. And I thought, wow. So, so they come down, the Canadian, the amount of Canadian actors we have here is amazing. I've got a friend that's one of the top voiceover guys in the whole business. And he went to Canada and he landed. And they said, what are you here for? And he said, no, we're doing a, we're doing a job. And they said, uh, well, uh, you know, you, you need this, we need this, we need this. I said, well, there's my producer. He's standing right there. He says, no, well, you can't come in because you don't have this. And, but there's the producer right there. And finally they said, would you escort him back to the plane? And they got four RCMP guys to escort him back to the plane. And he said, but, but there's my producer. I'm just here to do this work. And they, they turned and very harshly yearned at him said, said, we've got Canadian actors. We don't need American actors. I mean, it was just harsh. We thought, oh, well, gosh, I guess you better get uh, Michael J. Fox and <laughs> what's the guy, you know, the, the currently the, the, I mean, so many, God, holy smokes, there's so many. He says, well, tell them they can't work here. We've got American actors to do it. Is that the attitude we're supposed to have? So it was a one-way street and it really pissed a lot of people off. Mm. Uh, that we were being abused that way, letting everybody in, but we weren't allowed to go other places without being abused. So, yeah, I'm, that's a that's a sore point for a lot of actors that that were on the board and that knew about that. Mm. Yeah, I love talking about this stuff, and you guys are wonderful. Oh, it's Bob, really really fun. Robert really Hayes, fun. 
Robert Hayes, thank you so much for joining us on the Philosopher Show. You've been a delight. You're just a wonderful conversationalist and a lovely guy, and it's really been a joy to get to meet you. Well, I appreciate it. I've had a great time. Can't wait to see it. I hope you can snip it out and make me actually sound intelligent. <laughs> yeah. I'm hoping. I'm, kind of, I'm counting on your daughters to do that. We're, we're, we're yes. hoping. We're, 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 we're hoping you'll you can to help you uh, overcome your drinking problem. And we're yes. gonna yeah. we're gonna dub you into Farsi. Just that's right. That'll help. But just don't stand behind me because I just miss so often. I, I want to know how many takes you had to do on that. Did you have to do multiple takes? Uh, that? We did multiple takes. And every time you got to go back, dry your hair, you got to dry your shirt, sit down, do it again. And yeah, I, yeah. I think that's the definition of a trooper. <laughs> or a drinker. <laughs> Thanks so much, Bob. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. You take care. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us on the Philosopher's Movie Talk Show. Please subscribe to stay up to date on our newest episodes.